Thank you for uh, having me. And what I'm going to talk about today, let's see, um, is uh, so I, I've gotten a lot of questions lately about OKRs. It seems like it's the technique has been around for a long time, but uh, maybe the interest is going up or the sea level people, as Jurgen was talking about, have, have sort of gotten, um, gotten the OKR religion. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to talk about what are some pitfalls of using OKRs? How, how might it either help Scrum or undermine Scrum um, to give you some tools and techniques for improving OKRs if you're forced to using them uh, or, or if you decide to use them, there's nothing wrong with using them. Um, and then to introduce you to a framework called evidence-based management that scrum.org has developed that can help you improve your use of OKRs. So um, in case you're not familiar with OKRs, there's a, a relatively good description on Wikipedia. Um, it's basically OKR stands for objectives and key results. And it's, it's really quite simple. Um, you know, I, think, I think sometimes it sounds perhaps mysterious or sophisticated, but it's really quite simple. It's that you articulate the objectives that you want to achieve and you establish some measures that would indicate whether you would actually achieve those. Um, now, typically they're broken down into some long-term uh, objectives, uh, short-term objectives, and, and then flowing, flowed down from a company level to departments to sometimes individual levels. Um, typically, you know, done it sort of long-term as you know, three to five years, short-term, typically quarterly, but you could do them more frequently. Um, there's nothing in the technique per se that says what the time interval has to be, but this is typically how it's implemented. And then in the key results, the, it's some sort of measurable of, um, objective, um, words overloaded, me measurable, quantifiable indicators that you achieve, achieve the objective. And then typically they use more than one. Um, so there might be several different indicators that told you whether you're meeting that objective. Now, the problem is not so much with OKRs themselves and the way that they're defined, but with the way that organizations use them. So let me talk about and, and get to maybe the heart of my talk is that there are good ways to use them, there are bad ways to use them, and there are ugly ways to use them. And so the good way, is to provide clear targets for people. And so we, we do this really all the time in Scrum. We have sprint goals, we have now product goals. And so you know, that, those, those are sort of manifestations of, of different kinds of objectives. So there's nothing wrong with having objectives and having a good objective that helps provide focus can increase the autonomy and purpose for people on the team. Um, or, or people generally in the organization. The problem is when organizations, and, and here I probably more mean managers, use objectives to, in a sense, di more directly manage people. And so uh, I'll talk in a moment about three different kinds of measures, but um, when organizations focus on things like um, producing outputs or producing activities, uh, or, or performing activities, then they're starting to micromanage what people are doing. Um, they say, you know, I want, I want you to produce this report or, you know, I want you to perform this task. That can and usually does reduce autonomy and purpose. And that, that really starts to tear apart the, ty the type of things that we're trying to do in building up strong, high-performing scrum teams. So the ugly part is when it, it was when that devolves into micromanagement by numbers. So when you're using the OKRs as ways to reward people or to punish people, and that results in basically sometimes what we call gaming behavior or where people are, are spending more time focused on how they produce that number than trying to achieve some sort of meaningful result for the organization or for customers. So now that to, so, so that, that outlines the problem. We'll delve a little bit more deeply into that and talk about how you can overcome that. So the three different kinds of measures I mentioned are outcomes, which is some sort of change in, this, in the satisfaction of some customer or user or 
another stakeholder could be employees, but but typically it's outwardly focused on people in, in the market in, in the in the market that you're trying to to perform in. So customers, users, um, potentially investors, um, and so an example of that would you know we we all are facing right now uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen and. So we might say an outcome would be improving the infection, improving the infection rate of a group of people. So reducing the rate of infection, reducing the um, perhaps the prevalence of the disease in the population. Um, that would be an example of an outcome. Now, an output is something that think that people produce. So in the example of COVID, um, an output would be the number of doses of vaccine that have been administered. You hope that the, the administering the vaccine would improve the overall health rate in the population, but that's actually but administering the vaccine isn't the direct outcome that you're looking for. It's an it's potentially a contributing activity, and then finally, um, activities are things that people do, and that might be things like number of tests that have been run, um, or the number of uh, you know people that you've uh, tested. Um, so the, the, this difference between outcomes, outputs, and activities is interesting <clears throat> because outcomes are typically hard to measure, but those are the things that you want to achieve. The outputs and activities are easy to measure. And so what we see in organizations is many times that the, the measures that an organization captures, um, regardless whether it's part of OKR, an OKR framework or not, um, tend to be focused on outputs and activities, you know, number of builds that you did, number of features that you produced, um, you know, number of employees that you, you hired in the last quarter, um, or the activities, you know, number of tests that you've run, um, or, you know, the, the you know, did, did you have the sprint review, um, you know, on time, things like that. So outputs and activities are easy to measure, but they're really not relevant. Um, they, they might contribute in some way, but they don't, there's usually relatively little correlation between outputs and activities. So getting people to focus more on outcomes and less on outputs and activities is one of the major challenges that we usually find in most organizations. So I want to give you some examples and, and I'd just like to use the, uh, you could use the Q&A chat, uh, I think. Um, uh, to just sort of provide what you think. So these are actually things that I pulled out of either books on OKRs or off websites, and we're just going to do a couple of these. So this is from John Doerr. Um, his book, Measure What Matters, is sort of the, the canonical reference on OKRs. He's, um, he, he's recognized as sort of the, the at least the, the popularizer of OKRs, although it's based on an older technique called management by objectives. Um, but um, this, this particular example, build a planning model for the company. And the key results are finish presentation on time, create a sample set of quarterly OKRs, gain management agreement for a three month OKR trial. So uh, I, I just like to sort of open this up and see if any of you have ideas on how, could, how these could be improved or potentially um, if you don't have any ideas about how they could be improved, at least what's potentially wrong with, with the objectives or the key results that are here. Any any suggestions? Yeah, yeah. So so somebody said the why of the objective, um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. That's an excellent observation. Um, some of the other things to think about is that all of the key results basically are activities. Um, so this is this is. Uh, essentially, if you did all of these activities, would you actually achieve even that objective? Um, hard to say, maybe not. Um, so the, the real question is, why do you want to build a planning model for the company? What do you think that will achieve for you? What are you trying to achieve? What, and so by articulating that better, people can have a better understanding of what kinds of things they might need to do and perhaps come up with more creative uh, alternatives than even the, the key results are specifying here. So I'll show you another one here. 
Um, and it's kind of a similar one. Um, this is from another a website, um, but uh, it se seems to be quite popular uh, in the search. Uh, when I did a search, it came up fairly high on the hits. So this is something a lot of people are looking at when they look at okay, information about OKRs. And so the objective is to build along the world's longest bridge. And then there's some key results that might tell you whether you built the world's longest bridge. But the last three key results um, are very much activity oriented. The first one is output oriented. And, and the real question is, why do you want to build the world's longest bridge? And would that be useful to anyone? Perhaps the world's longest bridge uh, would connect two places where there's nobody on either end. And so nobody actually wants to travel there. So, uh, you know, unless you just have a huge amount of money to spend and you have, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, a desire just to show your engineering prowess, building the world's longest bridge by itself might not be a reasonable objective um, unless it's achieving some other outcome. So we'll show you um, that. So in my case, um, I think these OKRs could be improved by asking some questions. So the first one is finding the real objective, um, as uh, Oriel mentioned. Um, the, you know, and, and here you can use a technique that you probably have seen before, the five whys technique. Um, of course, you know, if, you, if you've used that, you know it's not just five whys, but you keep asking why until you found the real reason for, for pursuing this objective. And so in the example before, building the world's longest bridge, you ask why. Why do you, why do you want to do that? Well, you know, perhaps it's a matter of national pride. Perhaps it's, uh, you know, you've got a high amount of traffic between one point and another. Um, perhaps there's some other, other benefit that you're looking to achieve. But articulating the real reason helps you to understand what you really need to do. Um, and typically when you do, what I've found is that you find that the objective ultimately is some outcome that's, uh, you, you want to achieve some outcome for some group of people. So uh, you, you being more explicit helps you to understand who you're doing it for, what those people are trying to achieve or what they would like to achieve. And then you can talk about how do you measure success? And so then under key results, you start looking at uh, what kind of measures would tell you that you're clo getting closer to achieving that objective. And you might find that you have to achieve some other goals first or learn some other things in order to ach achieve the real objective. So uh, I'll give you an example that's <clears throat> maybe a, a little bit closer to what, uh, well, certainly what scrum.org does. Um, so in the age of COVID-19, you know, we, we've certainly had challenges as with, as with this conference um, to do things more virtually. <clears throat> and so an objective might be to make virtual training available for all courses by the end of the year. Um, so not a bad sentiment, but the question of why, why are we doing that? And I think a better objective when you look at why is that people want to be able to learn from wherever they are, whenever they need it. Now that might take many different forms. It might mean that some of the learning might be through things that they read, or they might be through videos that they can watch at their own time. And there might be other sort of more group experiences that you need to have. But understanding that this sort of learn from anywhere, whenever you, whenever you need it, and, and the need is important, that's not just want, um, might be better, uh, might, might help you better understand what your alternatives are. And then you might be able to pursue different options because taking the existing set of perhaps learning materials that you have and making making simply turn it, turning it into virtual training might not be the most effective way to achieve that objective. It might be part of it, um, certainly, um, but things change. I mean, vir virtual learning is different than in-person learning, and so you have to adapt. So uh, talk about a couple of other things. Um, we've developed a framework at scrum.org called evidence-based management. And what this is, is it's, it's an empirical, uh, and uh, basically organizational improvement framework that helps you use measurement to try to seek towards goals. And there's a couple of aspects of it that I'll talk about here. And they, they directly relate to what people are trying to do with OKRs. So I felt like this was relevant to bring in. 
So in evidence-based management, we have a couple of things. We have things like strategic goals and a strategic goal is very similar to strategic OKRs with a three to four year horizon. Um, they're sufficiently far out into the future that you don't know if that's exactly the right goal that you need to achieve, uh, which is why this sort of star representing the strategic goal looks like it's moving around a bit um, because it, it may change over time as you learn new things. The, the second part of this is an intermediate goal or a set of intermediate goals that are very similar to quarterly to yearly OKRs that provide nearer term focus. So, you know, if your goal is to, is to do something like, you know, eradicate the effects of COVID-19, we hope that the vaccines that are becoming available are, will do that, but we don't know. Um, and we might find that they only have a partial efficacy or, um, you know, if you look at, at other, other kinds of things, um, you know, we've not yet been able to eradicate things like HIV, um, but we still have that strategic goal that we'd like to do that. So the intermediate goals provide us with near term focus. And then we've got some sort of tactical goal, which would be equivalent to a sprint goal, um, which says that, well, for a two to four, two to four week cycle, um, we need to have something very specific that's tangible, um, that's time bound, that has very specific measures. And that hopefully will help us steer toward the intermediate goal and steering toward that will help us to achieve the strategic goal. So three levels of goals. And then within, let's say a sprint, uh, what, what we have is really an experiment loop. So if you think about a sprint, um, you have a bunch of hypotheses about increasing value. We happen to call those product backlog items. Um, we build those things. And as we do so, we measure them. We use the definition of done and we use um, you know, other things like uh, acceptance criteria or feedback from stakeholders or feedback from the product owner to determine whether we're building the right thing. Um, we hopefully deliver that to customers so we, we can then inspect whether we actually achieved what we hope to set out. And then we adapt based on that and we repeat the, the process. So uh, that hypothesis experiment measure inspect adapt loop is really just sort of a generalization of what we do in Scrum anyway, but it's applying it to a more general set of problems. Now, the, as I mentioned before, is that we want to inspect and adapt both the goals and the results. So we might find that the intermediate and strategic goals need to be adapted based on new insights. Um, we can, we can get some un unexpected results. So, you know, we, we might deliver a set of features and find out, you know, they didn't solve the problem that we thought that they were solving. Or we might deliver a feature and discover some new opportunity uh, for using that capability to solve some other, to, to um, provide some other outcome that we didn't know that feature was going to do. So we see that all the time. So evidence-based management consists of this sort of goal, um, seeking towards goals model. And then on top of that, we have, or, or let, let's say um, supporting that, we have some things called key value areas, which I think of as lenses for inspecting and adapting. They, they give us the ability to focus on different aspects of the problem so that we can focus our measurement in a, in a more general way. Um, so the, these four key value areas are unrealized value and current value, which together focus on more market value kinds of things. And then ability to innovate and tie into market, which focuses more on organizational capability to deliver market value. So unrealized value is the additional potential value that could be achieved if we could perfectly satisfy all the desired outcomes of our customers or users. So you can think of that as, an as, as the opportunity that you're seeking. Um, the current value is basically where are you relative to the potential value? Um, so what's the current experience of your customers or users? So you can think of that as performance against the goal. And then uh, below that line, the ability to innovate is how, effectively, how effective is the organization at improving value? So this is, um, perhaps less um, sort of less easy to understand until you think of some examples. So we all know that if, if we're working on a task and someone comes by and interrupts us, 
that we lose some productivity, that it takes us some time to get back to where we were before we got interrupted. And some psycholo psychology studies have shown them that's something like 20 minutes or so on average per interruption. So if we're constantly getting interrupted, we're not as effective as we could be if we could focus on the task and then deal with the interruption at the end of the task. So um, this, this ability to innovate or, or this effectiveness manifests itself in a number of different ways. It might be that um, the team develops relatively, you know, a low number of new features because they're spending too much time dealing with technical debt or they're spending too much time dealing with possible, um, dealing with defects or dealing with architectural issues or other things. So that would drag down the ability to innovate. Um, if they got pulled off into lots of meetings or they got pulled off onto other, uh, onto other teams, um, that would reduce the, uh, the effectiveness. And, and so then the, the final uh, key value area is time to market. And this is relatively easy to understand. This is what many organizations focus on when they want to be agile. They say, you know, we want to go fast, quote, they, they want to go faster. Um, but simply going faster, if you're not de delivering things that are valuable and if your ability to innovate or your effectiveness is low, going faster doesn't by itself help you to achieve the, the potential that you could achieve. So the, these four different areas, we, we like to consider them at, in holistically. So uh, we wanna look at both unrealized value, well, we wanna look at unrealized value and current value, but we also want to look at what does the organization need to do to improve current value. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, well, let me go through some definitions here. Um, so we talked about unrealized value, um, and typically strategic goals focus on unrealized value, or they should. Um, they should look at, you know, what do our customers need that, that they're not getting today from either us or from our competitors? Or maybe what do our customers need that they're getting from a competitor, but not from us? Um, but, but typically it's, you know, what, what do customers want to achieve that they can't achieve today in some other way? And so some of the questions you, you might back into that by, by saying, you know, is there, is there more market potential? If we could reach more people with our product, you know, it might be the current value is very high, which says that, you know, existing customers really like the product but the but that base is very small so it might be that you need to market more it might not be a development problem it might be a marketing problem or it might be a sales problem um you know is it worth the effort and risk to, pers to pursue further returns so basically you know we, we've all heard probably of the term cash cow on a product which basically says that there's relatively little value that can be uh, obtained from the market by further efforts on that product um, and so you might want to switch your focus to somewhere else. And so uh, you might want to look at uh, other alternatives. Um, so um, one thing I've, I've mentioned before is this idea about a satisfaction gap. So you can think of this in terms of a technique like persona modeling or empathy mapping. But you look at, you know, what can a customer achieve today and what would they like to achieve? And the difference between, <coughs> excuse me, their current experience and the experience that they'd like to have is a satisfaction gap. And so that satisfaction gap represents an opportunity to do something new. And so typically an objective, a good objective focused on unrealized value would focus on closing some sort of satisfaction gap. Um, so if, we, if you think about unrealized value, um, what are some measures you, that you think might be, that you might look at? Um, how would you measure that satisfaction gap? Any thoughts? So um, uh, as you're thinking about that, maybe some things that you, you could look at would be things like market share. Um, you know, how much market share do you have relative to how much market share do, does your competitor have? Um, so you might be able to improve, if you did a better job at satisfying 
the outcomes desired by customers, you might be able to improve your market share. Um, you could measure the customer satisfaction gap um, directly. You could do that through surveys. You could do it through focus groups. You could do it through um, potentially even measuring uh, things in the application itself, such as uh, kind of a feature usage rate or an abandon rate where you know you you just look at uh, you know how many how many uh, people you know you thought a feature was great but you put it out there and you find it's used once and then not used again so obviously there's some sort of gap between what the customer would like to achieve and what they were actually getting from what you delivered um, and so you might uh, you know look at things that way a current value um, is basically tells you where you are today. So how happy are customers? Um, what's their current experience? Um, what's, what's the current experience relative to what they would like to achieve? That, that would tell you the satisfaction gap, but just knowing what the current experience is, uh, is useful. Um, and you could look at whether that happiness is increasing or decreasing. Um, you, know, you might also wanna look at how happy are employees or how ha happy are investors and other stakeholders. And so, you know, we, we've heard things like uh, Richard Branson likes to say that, you know, if you want to have a successful business, basically you take care of your employees and those happy employees will, you know, basically lead to happy customers. And that, that tends to work in the service industry. Um, so, so you might want to look at uh, happy employees, uh, happy investors, um, obviously the ability to attract capital or investments is, is usually necessary to uh, do some of the work that you would like to do. <clears throat> so <clears throat> current values, some measures that you can think of, um, <clears throat> there might be things like, uh, well, you can just sort of skip on to, to the next one. Um, you know, you might look at things like employee satisfaction or customer satisfaction or customer usage index um, by feature. So you might say, you know, we we delivered a, a, a new set of features in the last release, and you look at the, the usage of that, and you find that as many when organizations start measuring this, um, that many of the features that they delivered that they thought were really important either don't get used or or they're underutilized. And so the question is, is that a usability problem, or is that actually a problem with the, your understanding of what customers really need? <clears throat> And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's, you know, the feature is hidden somewhere and people find it really valuable when they can find it. But they, but in other cases, you know, they, they look at it and they say, well, I, I don't find this useful. <clears throat> and, you know, you only have to look at your own usage of things like, let's say, Microsoft Word. And I'm not picking on Microsoft at all. It's just, a, it's a widely used example. Um, you know, how many features in Microsoft Word do any of us, if we use it, um, use on a daily basis or even, even periodically? Um, many of the features probably use hardly at all. Um, so, so there's obviously things there, but you know, there, there are other things perhaps that we'd like to do with the product that, that we find difficult. Um, so there's usually always a, some sort of satisfaction gap and you start measuring that by looking at current value. <clears throat> So then time to market. Some things to think about here are, uh, it's the amount of time it takes for the organization to deliver value, but you could ask the question, how fast can you learn from new experiments? Um, how long does it take you from the time that you learn some new piece of information to be able to respond to that? Um, and I, there's a, a metric that I added um, in the last release of the evidence-based management guide called time to pivot which is basically how long does it take you to respond to some sort of change in the market? Um, and for many organizations, this, this would capture their desires around agility um, much better than a lot of other things that they're using. But you know, how, how fast can you learn from new information and adapt? And how fast can you deliver value to customers? So um, you know, things like this um, on a daily basis, you might look at things like build an integration frequency. Um, you know, if you're if you basically are doing continuous continuous integration, then you're not, that's going to be very rapid. If you only did builds, let's say daily or or weekly or every couple of days, then you know your time to market typically is lower. So there's a correlation between build and integration frequency and time to market. Similarly, release frequency, you know, potentially that's a good indication of time to market. 
Although just because let's say you have weekly releases doesn't mean that your customer lead time or cycle time um, is one week. So it might take you several months to go from idea to the point where it's in customer's hands, even though you have weekly releases. Um, mean time to repairs is, is also sort of a, a measure of how quickly can you respond to at least technical changes, if not business changes. So I mentioned before this time to pivot. Um, these examples uh, uh, recommend it at the end that you, you can download the EBM guide for free at scrum.org, but these, these are in, in an appendix. Um, so you can look at these and, and, and think of your own. So one of the reasons why I've been asking questions about how you can measure it is that these aren't intended to be canonical measures that, that everybody should measure, um, but rather more examples that people should uh, think about and then try to adapt it to their own situation. So then finally, ability to innovate, and I, I like to think of this as, as the effectiveness measure. Um, <clears throat> the questions that come out of this are what prevents the organization from delivering new value, or potentially what prevents customers or users, users from benefiting from that innovation. So uh, a good example of this is that you might have very frequent releases, but if the customer organization can't consume them because of perhaps installation and upgrade challenges. Um, we saw this quite a long time ago now with Windows 95. It was, it was very hard for Microsoft to get people off of that platform, mainly because it was very difficult for them to migrate. Um, some things changed, some data formats changed. Um, you see this sometimes in, in conversion of, from one version of an application to another, um, where there's a lengthy conversion process and that prevents people from actually doing the upgrade. So it, it might not be just, um, in a sense, the internal functioning of the team, but it might be something about the structure of, and the, in the way that the product itself is delivered. So some ex examples here, um, there's something called the innovation rate, which is an interesting piece of data that you can probably pull out of your um, accounting systems or, or just look at, it at sort of a timekeeping system is that the, the amount of effort or cost that you're spending on developing new capabilities divide, divided by the total product cost. So if you could isolate the, the cost of, let's say, developing a particular feature, compared that to the, total, uh, to, the, to the total cost, then you'd find for many organizations, if they have a lot of old, older applications, it's not, it's not uh, atypical for them to have an innovation rate that's like 30%. In other words, they spend 70% of their time and effort, time and or effort on just maintaining existing applications, not developing anything new, but just essentially keeping the lights on. And as you become more effective, you, the higher performing organizations actually have inverted that. So they might spend 70% of their capability, potential capability on developing new capabilities versus 30% on just sort of the older things. Um, defect trends are useful um, on product and in indexes, another variation of, in of uh, innovation rate, which is how much time do you spend working on things that produce value versus things that are overhead, um, like status reporting or other kinds of things. Um, installed version index uh, is an interesting one because then you look at how the, uh, uh, so, so if you have five different versions of a product out there and you potentially have defects on all five of those, then you potentially have this problem of applying changes across multiple branches of a product, uh, whether it's a physical product or a software, it doesn't matter. The same thing works on physical products. And so what you might need to do is, is to try to work harder to, or, or at least understand why are there five different versions of this thing? Is there a way to get things to, to produce one version so that you can spend more of your time improving that one version instead of trying to keep five different versions in sync? Um, technical debt's another measure here. Um, production incident counts, active code branches, um, time spent merging code. These are all software specific. Um, time spent context switching is interesting. If you can measure it, you know, how many interruptions do people get during the day and you could just just ask them and and um, see you know how, how much time does this interruption cost you 
Um, so there's some interesting data, especially in the DORA report, if you're familiar with that. Um, uh, th those are usually DevOps related uh, types of changes, but they do, they do give you some ideas about other things. And so in these examples that I've been mentioning in the EBM guide, we, we do link to the DORA report for some of the measures. Um, so if we talk about seeking toward goals and things that we, we could do to achieve those things, um, if we use those key value areas, as I mentioned, like lenses to improve OKRs, then typically your, your objective should focus on reducing unrealized value. Um, if you're not focused on re reducing unrealized value in your objective, then it could be that your objective is more tactical which might be okay. It might be that you might need to improve some things in, in the short term to ultimately uh, reduce unrealized value. But ultimately, the organizations are typically focused strategically on uh, reducing unrealized value, if we use the term, the terminology in EBM. Um, so then under the key results, you should first try to measure the reductions in unrealized value. Look at, you know, how are we closing that satisfaction gap? That I mentioned before, or you know, how are we? How can we prove that we are improving the current value of the product? Is another way of thinking about that. But sometimes you might need to improve the ability to innovate or improve improve the time to market. So an example here would be that <clears throat> let's say that you have you know a a relatively high unrealized value that you'd like to you'd like to achieve. You, there's a big gap between the cu current customer satisfaction and what they would like to achieve. So satisfaction gap. Um, but if you're only releasing a product version once a year, it's going to be very difficult for you to close that gap very quickly. So what you might need to do in the meantime is improve your time to market. And then what you might find is that improving the time to market doesn't move the current value very much in each release because the ability to innovate is low. So you might need to improve time to market and ability to innovate in order to see significant improvements in current value, and then that would reduce unrealized value. So if we think about that, <coughs> you know, fairly typical situation, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, if if the unrealized value is high, meaning the market opportunity is large, and existing customers are not very happy, then um, you know. So that's those those are two situations that that are fairly common. Um, <clears throat> you know, each new release improve. You know, it, ability to innovate is low, so each new release improves current value very little. <clears throat> due to you know bug fixing and eruptions, et cetera, and it takes a long time to deliver, then the you know the kinds of things that you would improve first <clears throat> might be, you know, look to improve time to market a little bit, um, look to improve ability to innovate a little bit. And then when you deliver that release, improve current value a little bit, and then measure and see, okay, so our, our, you know, was was our experiment right? And I like to think of every product backlog item as a hypothesis about value. And so you might deliver a product backlog item or a feature or some new capability, but that's that's really a theory. No matter what your product owner says and no matter what your stakeholders say, that's still a theory about what customers actually want. And so as you deliver things, you should measure that customer experience and then feed that back into the, 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 your development process. And so, you know, it might take you a fairly long time. Um, another thing that you might find, I, met, I mentioned this briefly before, it's worth saying again, is that you might find that your ability to innovate is pretty good. <clears throat> your time to market is pretty good. Your current value is pretty good, meaning that customers are pretty happy with your product but your unrealized value is basically high because nobody knows about your product 
you, you need to do a better job of marketing. Maybe it's through viral marketing or, or it's through some other way, but more people have to find out about the value that you could provide to them. And <clears throat> so it might not be about development. It might be about other things that the organization needs to do. Um, now, almost every organization that I know of has um, opportunities to improve their ability to innovate, time to market, and current value. So, um, you know, th those are all usually ripe for, for improvement as well. Um, sometimes it's difficult to really express what customers are really looking for. So, um, Patricia Kong and I, um, Patricia is my colleague that we've developed a lot of the EBM ideas. Uh, we were working with a client one time and the client was having real difficulty expressing what their objective should be. And so after about five minutes of them discussing things, I, I thought, well, I, I need to try to get this discussion focused because this, is, this was at the beginning of a day uh, and, it, and we couldn't spend all day talking about you know, what, what the objective should be. So I asked the question, well, the original question was, how do you, me how do you measure success? And so they had a lot of disagreements about how they do that. And many of them said, well, we don't really measure our success. But I asked the question, how do your customers measure their success? And immediately, the, everybody focused in on a couple of key measures. They say, well, you know, the customer looks at it this way. And <clears throat> so I asked, you know, can you measure that in your product? And they said, yes, you know, we can. So that, that basically gave everybody a way to focus on it. So this switching the focus onto customers and what they need from the product often cuts through a lot of the sort of endless discussions that you have about, you know, how do you measure success and other things. So um, in, in conclusion, um, I guess the first thing to, to talk about is that OKRs by themselves can be good. Um, but often they're not used in a very good way. And you know, that, that the, depending on how they're used could be bad or, or it could really be damaging for the organization depending on how they use them. So if, you, if the organization focuses on goals, focuses their goals on outcomes, then it tends to produce a, a very good healthy discussion in the organization. But if they focus them on outputs or activities, first of all, it's, it's easy to game those things, just like um, it's easy to, to game things like velocity. Well, velocity is an output measure. Um, so getting people to focus on outcomes and not activities and outputs is, is really the, the fundamental shift for most organizations. And then the second thing is that the whole purpose of OKRs is to try to create alignment and transparency around the organization's goals. And so if you micromanage people with, by using focusing OKRs on activities and outputs, then you don't have that transparency on what the organization is really trying to achieve. And so the third thing is that you're going to, when you start measuring things, you're going to find that a lot of the things that you thought you knew aren't true. And so you find that, you know, your objective needs to be tuned a little bit, or, you know, your strategic goal needs to be tuned, or the intermediate goal needs to be tuned a little bit, maybe changed a lot. Maybe you find that <clears throat> that's not really what customers want at all. And you, you have to change your whole outlook on things. So the, the, the best thing that you can do is to get that feedback early and then you use that as an opportunity to learn. So if you use those opportunities to learn to guide how you shape both your experiments and shape your goals, then you're much more effective at reaching those goals than if you're using the OKRs to punish or reward. Because when you do that, when you're managing to out outputs or activities, you're basically saying that whoever came up with those key results and even the objective has, you know, perfect knowledge of everything and they know exactly what needs to be done and they just need you to do it. <clears throat> and typically that's not the case. Um, you know, we all have blind spots. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying that management is bad. 
and teams are good, um, you know, everybody has blind spots. So, so sometimes, you know, the, the least experienced person on the team might have an insight that, uh, that everyone else overlooked because they've all been in the problem too long. And so, you know, if, if you can learn and be open and be transparent about the, what the goal is, it's easier to learn from those things. Um, the second thing is that long OKR cycles, even, even quarterly OKR cycles are really too long to learn. And so, um, you know, the, the reason why Scrum focuses on, you know, two to four weeks sort of maximum and ideally even, you know, delivering all the time and measuring all the time is that those fast learning cycles give you so much insight into what to do next that you reduce, you over, over time, you reduce the waste that's built into your product backlog. There's a lot of stuff in the product backlog that isn't needed by anyone. You just don't know it yet. And so being able to evaluate those assumptions and then inspect and adapt objectives and goals is really important. And then the third thing is that you might find that the goals or the objectives, you can't move directly toward them. You need to do some other things first. So, you know, if you currently have long release cycles um, and you know, even if you know that customer satisfaction is low, you need to improve your time to market first because you can't even run experiments on changing the current value very quickly. And so that's usually the first thing. And then improving the ability to innovate is usually the second thing um, if the organization currently has long release cycles. Now, if you have quick release cycles and, and, um, and good ability to innovate, then you can start trying out new ideas really quickly and you can change current value really quickly and you can see that satisfaction gap reduce really quickly, but most organizations aren't quite there yet. Um, and so you might need to focus on those things sort of that I drew below the line in that one, that one diagram. So a um, couple things is that um, I, I wrote a blog about this topic, uh, just published it a week or so ago. So, um, you know, if you, if you look for me on scrum.org and you find this blog, um, it, it articulates a lot of what we talked about today. Um, Second thing is that also on scrum.org, there's the evidence-based management guide, uh, which we published a new version of in, in uh, September. And there's also a white paper on using the concepts in EBM to make portfolio management decisions. So that might be uh, useful. Um, basically it's, it's how to run those experiments sort of at the portfolio level um, and not just at the individual team level. Um, so with that, I think we've got some uh, time for maybe five minutes or so for questions, uh, if you have any. Um, and I hope that, hope that you do. OK, let's see some, uh, some questions. This is the last uh, talk uh, of this uh, track. You have a great opportunity to ask uh, Kurt about uh, EBM, about OKRs, his experience. <clears throat> we can even talk about scaling questions too. I get those a lot. Yeah. Questions about Nexus, scaling Scrum. <clears throat> we still have a few minutes before we do the overall closing for everyone. I would like just to, to make you one question, uh, Kurt. Uh, in your, according to your experience, uh, is uh, OKRs are very popular. Uh, are OKRs being set by people in product or people in management and not by agile teams? Do you think that uh, the, the people driving this framework in the organizations is different outside the Scrum teams or nothing? Or, or, the Scrum teams are doing that as well? Um, so yeah, most of the time, the OKRs tend to come from the top down. <clears throat> and that's really part of the problem um, is that when the objectives are stated in terms of activities or outputs, 
the people higher up in the organization aren't really the best people to understand what needs to be produced or what activities need to be performed. So, you know, we talk a lot about bottom up intelligence. And so a better way to use OKRs is to have, you know, the strategic objectives set by, you know, perhaps the C-level, um, but, uh, but then open it up and, and use that, use the forming of the OKRs as, as a discussion opportunity to engage really everyone who's going to be involved to say, okay, so this is the objective that we think we want to achieve and get feedback on whether that objective seems clear and, and uh, reasonable, but then have the discussion about, well, what do you think we could do to achieve that? And how would we measure if we actually achieve that? So, so it becomes really kind of a, a bottom-up uh, involvement in setting the key results and then, you know, similar to what we do in, in sprint planning, um, you know, the, the product owner doesn't tell the team how to, what they need to do to achieve the product backlog item. They just say, you know, th this, these are the things that I think are important. Let, let's discuss how we could achieve that. And so, um, you know, we, we want to try to take those same, that same bottom up intelligence and apply it to OKRs. Um, but you're right, mo most organizations don't do it, don't use them that way. They tend to micromanage people with OKRs and that's where a lot of the problems come in. Okay, good, thank you. I ha we have a couple of questions. The first one by Claudio. Uh, OKR for product versus OKRs for engineering. Each department should have their own OKRs. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, that implies kind of a, a, a siloed organization. So if the objective is focused on closing some sort of customer satisfaction gap, then the objective should be the same for everyone. Um, everyone who's engaged in delivering value to a particular set of customers. Now the key results might vary depending on the department, um, but ideally even those are state, should be stated in terms of some sort of outcome that's achieved. Um, so breaking it down um, in, into sort of separate product versus engineering or, or into separate silos, um, it, it usually doesn't produce something that's meaningful. So, you know, you, you would like everyone to collaborate together to try to figure out how they could achieve the objective and then set their own sort of uh, key results for whether, they, whether they're making progress toward that objective. If you broke it down and you said, well, the accounting department has to do this and the, and the product engineering department has to do that and, the, and design has to do this and marketing has to do this, then whoever's coming up with those key results is the one who's in, in their head figuring out how to do the integration instead of having the people work together to figure out how to integrate. So it, it really should be a collaborative effort across everyone involved in, in let's uh, using the term value stream, everybody involved in the value stream really should um, be involved in trying to come up with uh, what key results do we collectively need to um, uh, to uh, achieve. Um, the other question, uh, you know, what OKRs can we think about employee engagement? Um, so, you know, a, a good one might, uh, so th there's really simple ones. Um, you could put a little, um, sort of a little um, kind of kiosk uh, at the exit of the building uh, so at the end of the day, you just indicate, you know, sort of happy, neutral, sad in terms of how your day went <clears throat> um, or, you know, the, you know, what's your general satisfaction with your work today. Um, so that's that's kind of a simple one to do. Um, other ones are, are doing employee surveys um, of various types. You can do focus groups. Um, you could, you know, ask people kind of a, you can have a net promoter score. Um, to say, you know, to, would you recommend to your friends or colleagues to come work here um, and have it do, do it anonymous, anonymously? And that might tell you things about, you know, how engaged your employees are, how happy they are. Um, and um, the, 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 the next question about um, KGRs, um, it sounds like, you know, key goal indicator, um, uh, similar kind of idea. It's, and, and so, you know, in any of these, Focus the, try to focus the goals on outcomes and then try to focus the indicators on, you know, 
things that would indicate that would tell you or indicate whether you are making progress toward the goal and don't use them to reward or punish, but rather just more as a measure of progress. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I would say the other, other thing to think about is that um, you don't always want to assume that the goal is the right goal. Uh, so you want to, in your key indicators, you know, have some tests to see, is that, is that in fact the right goal? Um, are we focused on the right things? Do, do customers really want the things that we think that they want? and uh, build that somehow into the measures. But all of this, you wanna learn, you wanna learn from the experiences, not, not use them to reward or punish. And that's, that's pretty, kind of a pretty standard principle these days in um, sort of employee compensation is that you, tr you try to separate um, sort of you know, performance from, in a sense, the, the work that's, that's done because it, it, somebody might perform a task very effectively, but, if it's the wrong task, then it doesn't really contribute to results, but it's not their fault. Um, you you wanna look at that more as an opportunity to learn to say, well, we thought that task was important, but it turned out that, that it's not, um, but you did the task very well. So anyway, I hope that helps.